A conversation with Wisconsin U.S. Congressman Mark Pocan this morning on For the Record. Good morning, I'm Neil Heinen. Former Wisconsin state legislator, former Madison business owner, longtime Madison resident, Mark Pocan is well into his first term as a United States congressman, a Congress the historical significance of which is hard to overstate, both the good and the bad. It's time we check in with the congressman again, and I'm pleased to welcome back to For the Record, Mark Pocan. Mark, thanks very much for coming back. Absolutely. Thank you, Neil. Last we talked, um, really, it wasn't that far after orientation, and uh, there were some things you liked about getting immersed into congressional life in Washington. But I remember even then you said uh, you were quickly split into partisan groups. And my guess is it hasn't gotten a whole heck of a lot better. No. In, in fact, if anything, uh, on the Republican side, you know, they're split with another uh, divide between the Tea Party right. and the more mainstream Republicans. And uh, it's been a very uh, difficult session. Obviously, we haven't gotten uh, nearly enough done uh, that we need to get done. So we're going to have a lot to do in the remaining time. But, you know, when going through the government shutdown and those sort of things, uh, it's been an unfortunate uh, first year. Now, listen, just to be just to be fair, is there is there no similar split, even though it would be much more subtle? In the, in the Democratic Party as well? Um, actually, there isn't. You know, we, we have a, a wide variety of folks, as do the Republicans, but what we don't have is almost this um, extreme, almost jihadist sort of wing that unless you're absolutely pure, they challenge you, they, they do everything you do to obstruct. Uh, we don't have a Tea Party within the Democratic Party side. So I feel bad for my colleagues on the Republican side who are, uh, many of them are very reasonable people. We may disagree on issues, but at the end of the day, we could probably find resolution to many issues, but they're held hostage like we're held hostage right. by that same 30 or 40 hardcore Tea Party people that only only want to say no. It, it makes it difficult for everyone. There has been some speculation that the Tea Party influence was diminished in the aftermath of the government shutdown and budget stuff. Do you sense that? You know, I, I think so. I think a lot of people, when I talk informally to members, especially on the Republican side, I mean, they they were just as upset, if not more, with what was going on than we were. Uh, the polling showed public uh, clearly said the Republicans went too far. Don't know why they shut us down, brought us to the brink of not paying our bills. And many of the mainstream Republicans felt uh, just like uh, I did in most of the constituents that I talked to about that. So I think the next time they try to overplay their hand, potentially uh, they won't be able to. But the real problem is Speaker Boehner kind of allowed it to happen. And because many Republicans are afraid of Tea Party primary challengers, uh, they kind of sometimes went along to get along. Uh, you know, not people like Reed Ribble in Wisconsin. He voted to reopen government. He's being threatened with a primary challenge, and he stood strong. And I give him a lot of credit. He's doing what he thinks is best for the state. But uh, in a lot of other cases, people kind of, to avoid uh, having to deal with the primary, went along with that 30 or 40 people that held us all hostage. It's been a little quiet right now, and I, I think, I think the, the sense is, is that, is that uh, Paul Ryan and, and, and Patty Murray are off sort of trying to figure out how to, how to keep this from happening. But what's your sense of sort of the immediacy of this flaring up again, and will there be any really substantive difference in how Congress approaches these upcoming sure. issues? Yeah, I think it's very unlikely we'll have another shutdown. Uh, of course, I said that this last time. Right. I thought it was unlikely because reasonable people wouldn't have brought us there. But the fact that they've played that hand and that so many of their members are upset about what happened, I don't think we'll have another shutdown. Uh, however, at the same time, I don't know if you'll see a, a grand bargain or a big deal come out of what's going to happen in budget talks. I serve on the budget committee. We meet on a regular basis with Chris Van Hollen, who's our ranking uh, Dem on the committee, who's uh, also our ranking Dem on the committee from the House Democratic side that's dealing with this budget uh, impasse. I'm guessing that what you won't see is a, a big, big uh, deal encompassing a lot of different areas, but perhaps something on a smaller scale but allows us to keep government open. Uh, but then we've got a lot of other things to get done right after that. Since you've mentioned your committee assignments, it's worth noting that this past week um, you were assigned a, another uh, a committee assignment, and uh, it's a pretty influential committee, the Education and um, uh, Workforce uh, Committee. 
And the way I understand it, it's, it's somewhat unusual at this point in the term to get an assignment like that. Is that right? Yeah. What happened is there was an opening uh, because um, uh, Mark, Congressman Markey from Massachusetts got elected to the Senate. There was an opening on energy and commerce, one of the exclusive committees. Uh, John Yarmouth from Kentucky, who's been around for a while, got appointed to that and created an opening on this committee. I wanted this committee in the beginning because it deals with all the higher education issues, K-12, pre-K, uh, labor issues, um, uh, job training issues, things that are real important to me as a small business owner and a former legislator. Uh, but no freshman got on the committee on the Democratic side. It was taken by senior members, and seniority uh, is a big impact uh, when you pick committee assignments. But because of that opening, I made a play for it, and I was very fortunate to get on that committee. So now I can deal with things that directly affect you know, higher education, K-12, to uh, labor issues, minimum wage, uh, things like and uh, a wide variety of issues that are important to me come through that committee. And I'm really glad uh, to have a chance to serve on that. Now, unlike maybe what might be you know a, a hopeful expectation on uh, on the floor even within the caucus freshmen can make a bit of a difference at the committee level is that fair to say oh absolutely and you know one of the other things is because of the seniority system getting on the committee now um, essentially I'm getting a jump over 50 other freshmen who will eventually wind up on that committee and seniority gets you slots on subcommittees and other things so you know um, pensions I mean all this sort of things that affect real people in the second congressional district throughout South Central Wisconsin come through that committee and by being on there now I can start trying to work at that committee level and subcommittee level on issues that are important to people in the district, important to me. So have you been hearing more from University of Wisconsin folks in the last week? Uh, I just went and toured the UW <laughs> Hospital uh, this, uh, this week, uh, and uh, you know we've been doing uh, lots of things like that. But you know I've always had, that's been a passion, obviously coming from this area. I was at Beloit College this week, uh, which is a, a long-term, um, small, private, sure. well-respected private university in the district. Uh, we've got two-year campuses. We've got other uh, private colleges. There's a lot of higher education in this area and it's really important to the district. Well, I know that um, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act is something that you've cared deeply about. When we come back, we will talk about that right after this. For uh, folks uh, like myself in the LGBT community, the opportunity to be judged in the workplace by your skills and qualifications, your loyalty, your work ethic, is uh, an important pronouncement for this nation. Senator Tammy Baldwin, of course, a longtime friend and colleague of my guest this morning, Congressman Mark Pocan. Uh, talking about the uh, Employment Non-Discrimination Act, which the Senate passed, Congressman Pocan, you are an original co-sponsor of the House version of that bill. It's got to be at least somewhat heartening to see it pass the upper house. Uh, very much so. You know, long overdue. Mm, right. uh, I think you know when you look at polling, something like 80% of the people think this is already the law, and yet it's not. You can right. be fired for who you are and who you love. And I think the fact that it was such a strong bipartisan vote we have 195 bipartisan sponsors in the House. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to make sure it passes the House, even though uh, right now the Speaker is telling us um, he's not looking to schedule it. I know if it gets scheduled, uh, it will pass the U.S. House of Representatives. And right now it is in Speaker Boehner's hands as far as whether uh, yes, it, it, as far it gets as scheduled scheduling for the a bill, vote, huh? Uh, the Committee of Jurisdiction just happens to be the one I just got appointed to, Education and Workforce, which is great. So I can uh, hopefully, if we can get it to that point, be a part of that discussion. But well, it hasn't even gotten to committee yet in the uh, House? Not to uh, any kind of hearings uh -huh. uh, at that point. And uh, the fact that the Speaker um, has this control, the problem is what we saw what happened during the shutdown is he let the 30 or 40 people in the Tea Party kind of speak for everybody instead of speaking for uh, the entire House of Representatives. Our job is to convince him that this is uh, something that's long overdue. Um, business leaders support it. It passed in a bipartisan way in the Senate. Uh, it's something that we need to do. Even he has said he thought it already was the law. Let's make it the law, and then we can move on to all the other things we need to deal with. Yeah. Um, despite uh, the really serious problems that are caused by the gridlock in 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 in, in the Republican caucus in particular, mm -hmm. um, and how that plays out on on a lot of social issues, it does seem like in the last year or so, more Republicans have 
come out uh, in, in support of marriage, in support of non-discrimination. Does that, is that accurate? Uh, Do you feel like that's true? You know, this is classic when um, I always people talk about elected leaders. The way I think about it is so often the public is ahead of us, and this is one where on this particular bill about non-discrimination and employment, two-thirds of the public support it. 56% of Republicans support it. Again, the public's way ahead of us. Hopefully we'll catch up and then we can take that title that we're elected a leaders again. But really we're following where the public's at and it's time for us to do that. Uh, I, I just see that happen over and over in different issues and uh, I think the public's right on it. Well, uh, hearing from the public is illustrative in many, many ways. And, and so just now in, in the past few weeks as you've been going around the district, what are people saying to you about the Affordable Care Act and their experiences with it and what they read and what you know to be true? Sure. You know, I think one of the things when we have conversations about it, we're trying to make sure people realize uh, the Affordable Care Act was not uh, a law to create a website. It was a law that made sure that people with pre-existing conditions got access to health care. You didn't have a lifetime cap on the amount of health care you can receive. That women paid the same as men because there was price discrimination. That children could stay on their parents' policy until they're 26. That you had preventive care so we can save the expensive uh, care down the road. That that's still there. That's the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the problem is right now is in the website to sign up uh, has been a failure and they have to fix it and they're working on that uh, and if we have to adjust other things to make up for that, uh, extending deadlines, whatever, I think the President's and the Congress is willing to do that but you can still sign up via paper, you can still sign up via phone. Uh, we hear from a lot of people who obviously didn't have access who now are going to have access. That's very important but I'm also hearing from people who have had problems trying to sign up and they can't on the website they get the failure notice and uh, that's got to be fixed and we're going to do everything we can to improve it where we need to improve it. Now Mark, I also, I, 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 I've read that there are problems with some insurance premiums going up and it looks to me like that's true. On the other hand, you see a state like Kentucky which seems to be just really doing well yeah. in terms of both premiums and access. How, you know, how do we get our hands around this? Yeah. You know, it's it's obviously a big law. It's a very complex law. When Medicare came in place, there were similar speed bumps in a variety of areas. That's what we're experiencing now. But what you just mentioned about Kentucky, where you have a state that's cooperating and putting together exchanges, that's very successful. People are signing up. When you look at a state like Wisconsin, I saw a chart recently, and we were, uh, of all the states they listed that weren't cooperating in every single category, the only state that was in every single category was Wisconsin. Uh, we have kicked off more people off of Medicaid than any other state in the country. Uh, so there there is a problem when you have a governor or a legislature that doesn't cooperate and we do run into that problem. Uh, at the same time, I mean, I'm sure we're going to have other issues that we're going to come up with that we have to improve the law. I saw the president this week gave a very strong uh, statement about he's committed to doing that. I was on a call with the White House this week uh, and they gave us that strong commitment. So uh, let's work together to fix the law. It is the law of the land and I think uh, most people, Democrats and Republicans, realize that's what we need to do and improve it where we need to. No, I mean, I, I think I think virtually everybody believes that the computer problems are fixable. Right. But something like, like uh, an, an, an insurance hike, which was a promise that would not happen, is that an issue that is indeed fixable? Is that a glitch in the system? Yeah, and I think that's one of the things the president addressed this week. I think one of the concerns, he said, you'll be able to keep your policy. And right. the problem is the policy is a different policy under the Affordable Care Act. There's many different provisions. So I think what he was trying to say is, you know, if you can't keep your direct policy because some companies are going to drop that coverage, that's why we have the exchanges in place and you'll be able to keep a very similar uh, policy at hopefully a very similar price. That's the intent. And he said he's going to do everything he can to make sure uh, through executive orders he's going to get that done. So again, I think the patience that we have, we've got a lot of time still to sign up. Uh, I think they made some mistakes strategically in the beginning. You had to answer 20 questions to find out what the rates were, who buys the first day you shop. Uh, you know, now I think they've addressed some of that. You can get a chance to look at the rates and compare it. But now we have to be the, the good consumers and go through that process. But we're committed to making sure it works. I wasn't here when the law was passed, but I am here while it's to be implemented, and I'm committed to making sure it's implemented well. Um, end of last week, the president also said that uh, he was going to sort of finalize the parity issue for mental illness. And um, I, again, I think that's something that, that he will do without Congress. Is that correct? Uh, I, I think he's looking at it, but we also have some measures before us around mental illness. And. Uh, you know, it's a little uncomfortable because in some people's eyes it's tied to gun violence and while there's a little bit of, of, of a correlation there in some cases, I'm afraid that 
it, it's often yeah. portrayed as um, this is a major cause of gun violence is mental illness, which is overstating the case. Right. Yeah, because of my time in the legislature, I spent a lot of time working on corrections issues. 20 to 25 percent of our population in corrections is there because of mental illness, because we're not doing things in the community early enough to help avoid some of that. I just visited a homeless program this week here in uh, Madison uh, that deals specifically with people with mental illness and a lot of veterans with mental illness and getting casework. Uh, it's a lot more than gun violence around mental illness. It's a serious issue that I think someday, 20 years from now, people are going to look back and go, can you imagine how we used to deal with mental illness, that we didn't deal with it in a sophisticated way like any other illness uh, as we do? So I'm uh, very happy to see that the president's got initiatives, that Congress has, the legislature next week here in Wisconsin is taking up some initiatives. Uh, it's time that we finally have this conversation. I think it's been uh, held back for way too long. We're going to talk about food and food stamps when we come back with Congressman Mark Polkin right after this. I don't know how we're going to do that. We're, we're going to continue to do as much as we can, uh, get as much food as we can, uh, alert the people that work with us, the agencies, our partners, to, to understand the need and, and have them do as much as we can and get it out to them. That was my guest this morning. He just wasn't saying anything. <laughs> Congressman Mark Pocan. I think he was saying something at some point during that meeting. Uh, Dan Stein uh, from uh, Second Harvest talking about uh, issues having to do with SNAP. And I would just like your perspective on this. Um, I, I've written about it. I've written about the politics of the Farm Bill and uh, and the uh, probably inappropriate politic politic You know what I'm saying. I got you. <laughs> Of, of, the, of the food stamp or SNAP right. program, as it's called now, connected to the Farm Bill. How do we get ourselves out of this, Mark? Well, they're in conference committee right now, and I think uh, this is another one where the Tea Party contingent went too far. At first, they're going to pass a farm bill with $20 billion in cut to food stamps based on nothing. It's not a, a budget buster. Uh, it's something that is a supplemental food program for low-income children, seniors, severely disabled, that's three quarters of the people who get food stamps. And you add the working poor, you're up to over 92% of the people. And that's a meager 3150 a week per person. I mean, this is a supplemental program. And uh, we really need to do everything we can to make sure that people, especially while the economy is still coming back, have access to that. So I think uh, the fact that they've taken that and then when they couldn't pass the farm bill with that, they doubled down on the cuts to $39 billion. That's a very different version than the Senate. So I think as the conference committee goes forward, we'll get something much closer to what the Senate has. Uh, those cuts are draconian. They're unnecessary. Uh, they're mean-spirited, I think, ultimately. Uh, and I, I this this year, I lived for a week on food That's stamps. Right. That's uh, right. I was one of about seven members that lived for a whole week, and about 30 of us lived for a few days on it. And, you know, it's a very supplemental program. It's peanut butter, ramen noodles. It's, it's basic sort of stuff uh, as a supplement. And when most of the people uh, are kids and low-income seniors and people are severely disabled or working poor, uh, this is something we need while the economy still hasn't come back. Now, some of the defense of these cuts is based on allegations of fraud um, that uh, it, it, with, with with voter fraud, you can you can just almost point to the the non-existence of it. But in, in in this case, there are some instances of food stamp fraud. Can we get at that? Because yeah. I think we need to. Yeah. yeah, of course we just, can get at that. Rather than affecting everyone on the program, I think so often, like voter fraud, the fraud on this issue, the real fraud, is the the fraud about the conversation about both. You know, really over exaggerating the numbers and saying that there's no other way to address it. Uh, so we can definitely deal with that, and we are dealing with that. But to tell uh, a poor kid or a poor senior that they're not going to get a uh, supplemental uh, program, 860,000 people in Wisconsin count on that. And when I was at Second uh, Harvest, one of the things they told us, if the cuts that are in the House version of the Farm Bill were to take place, they would have to double what they're currently doing in providing food in order to meet the demand. And that's just uh, not possible in the current uh, scenario. This is, I think, a, a genuinely nonpartisan issue, and so I'm, 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 and so I'm interested in in your feelings about um, uh, the national security stuff sure. and and uh, what this country's policies are in terms of security and and collecting information and data. How do you feel about that, Mark? Sure, you know, and this is one where uh, the votes have been really all over the board. Sure. Democrats and Republicans on one side with Democrats and Republicans on another side. And Democrats unhappy with the Obama administration oh, in some cases. Including myself uh -huh. uh, in, in some cases. You know, I think we have to have that balance between security needs and privacy needs, 
but so far the balance has all been on security needs and not on privacy needs. So you know, I've signed on to a bill that uh, Republican Congressman Jim Sensenbrenner from Wisconsin has put forward uh, to try to restrain the NSA and what they've done. And I think not only the fact that I don't think Congress or the public knew how widely they were collecting everything from emails to phone calls to other information, uh, but when recently it showed how extensively our own allies that we've been eavesdropping on, that has so many other ramifications and yeah. policy, and I think it's time to, to rein them in. Uh, we want to make sure we have the proper security and we can find that balance, but it doesn't mean you have to listen in on every aspect of someone's life, and those are important privacy concerns, and uh, I'm going to work with Democrats or Republicans who share that view, and I just want to add, Russ Feingold, warned us about this. When the Patriot Act passed and he voted against it, he said this was one of his fears and everyone said, oh, that'll never happen. I think it's gone probably even beyond what he said could happen and uh, now it's time to rein that in. Do you think it's possible? I mean, just given how technology, how accessible technology is, how hard it is to rein in technology. Can we really do that or are we living in a whole different world? Well, it's Mark. reining in how widely we collect data. Do we really need to collect as wide of a, a giant fishnet of data and then hold it for as long as we do uh, when you know we're trying to protect the security of the country and instead we're, we're doing a very different sort of search and I think that's where people's concerns are you want to know you've got privacy on your own conversations on your emails uh, but you know if you're a bad player uh, we should be able to try to find out what people are up to and protect for that security. Yeah. So I, I think it's definitely a balance we can find, but all the balance right now is on the security side, not on the privacy side, and we need to pull some of that back. All right, we've got about a minute left. Do you have an agenda for 2014? Uh, you know, are you, are you thinking, okay, here's yeah. what I would like to do. In I'll tell you, it hasn't changed since we sat down in the very beginning um, you know, of the year. We need to work on jobs in the economy. If you get people back working, they're paying taxes, that helps us across the board in so many other areas. Uh, we really need to emphasize uh, more work on that. Uh, and also, I would add, I think the immigration uh, reform is really important to me and to Democrats and Republicans that I know. Uh, and we need to get that done. We need to make sure there's a path to citizenship for aspiring Americans and also provide the proper protections for our borders. I, I think that bill still has a good chance to happen as well. Those are connected, don't you think? Completely. Immigration completely and jobs in the economy? Yeah. Yep. Every Everything we do should be focused right now on jobs in the economy while we're trying to bring the economy back. Uh, we've been doing it so slowly, uh, but we need to do it a little faster, and um, I I'm committed to that, and I'm going to continue to be committed to that. Do you have new opportunities in this new committee to work on that? Well, absolutely. All of our job training uh, issues come through there. Education, I mean, that's all tied in with jobs, right? Education, right. job training, uh, research and development, all the things that we should be investing in, and also I think we should invest in some infrastructure again. Let's get people back working immediately while we can. Uh, we saw the positive effect when it happened before. Congressman Polkan, thanks very much for taking the time. Yeah, absolutely. I Thank you. It. Okay, Appreciate We'll come it. back and wrap up for the record right after this. My thanks to Mark Polkan for being here. We'll see you next Sunday morning for another For the Record. Thanks.